Let me give you all a very warm welcome to our service this morning from uh, Jewsbury Evangelical Church. Welcome to those of you who are at home and joining us online and uh, trust the Lord will be with you as you worship there and that you'll feel very much at one with us by the power of the Spirit. If you're here uh, in the building for the first time or joining us online for the first time, a very special uh, welcome. Today we are thinking about uh, faithfulness and we're going to begin with thinking about the faithfulness of God. So let me uh, read to you a couple of verses from Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God's faithfulness flows from who he is, the eternal, unchanging, reliable God. Well, let's uh, sing of his faithfulness with the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Those of you at home, please uh, sing out. Those of us here, uh, let's uh, sing in our hearts. Let's uh, hum quietly behind our masks. Let's uh, tap our feet, whatever we need to do to engage in the words of this great hymn. Great is thy faithfulness.
Come and uh, seek God in prayer. Please follow me as I lead us to the throne of grace. Our God, we come and acknowledge what a great and faithful God you are. You do not change. Truly from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And Lord, we thank you that you are therefore totally dependable and trustworthy. And so we come from all the uh, chaos of our broken and messed up world, all the complications and difficulties of our lives, and we turn again to you this morning to lift our minds and hearts high to the great, unchanging, faithful and true God. We thank you that every word that you speak and it's been revealed to us in your word, is true and believable. And we thank you that when we turn to this uh, uh, great book that you've given us, the Bible, there we find words of compassion and grace. And we praise you for them, the richness of them and the, the kindness of your heart then. When we couple that with your faithfulness, what a good and wonderful God you are and what a delight it is then to uh, to know you we realize we don't deserve to have that relationship with you because of our our sin and rebellion and wickedness but you our God have been merciful and kind and have given your own son the Lord Jesus that we might know you how we praise you for him and praise you that we can know you we thank you our God that you are a kind heavenly father And when many today are celebrating fathers and uh, giving thanks for them, we want to do the same and thank you, our God, for uh, our fathers and uh, for the fathers who are here. And Lord, bless them and we thank you for them. But Lord, we thank you that you are the true and the perfect father of all compassion and mercy and grace, of wonderful consistency. And Lord, we pray that as we come to worship, whether we're here together in the building or whether we're uh, connecting in and joining online, Lord, we pray that you would be a work by your spirit in the hearts and lives of each one of us. We pray that you would remind us again of your faithfulness. What a wonderful and dependable God you are. Lord, if we've doubted that, if we've... uh, started to wonder whether that's true because of all that we've been through. Bring us back to see again who you are and all your splendour and kindness and glory. And Lord, we pray though not just to open our eyes to see who you are and all that you've done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ, but also we pray that you might transform us to be faithful people who truly do deserve the mark of this fruit of the spirit of faithfulness. So Lord our God, meet with us, we pray. Uh, Hear our prayers now, accept our praise, 
and be at work in our hearts and lives. And we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Well, God's faithfulness is seen in uh, Jesus Christ. So let's uh, declare his glory together. We're going to read from uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. We're going to read these words together as a confession and statement of appreciation of uh, who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Uh, And then um, you all stop when the blank screen comes from the end of verse 20. And then I'm going to read the next two or three verses to you after that. So let's read together uh, 15 to 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once... You were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Well, let's uh, sing of that wonderful saviour who has rescued us and saved us in Christ alone. Uh, He is completely reliable and trustworthy. So uh, let's sing the words of this wonderful song. Light of the world by darkness 
struggling in that song to remain quiet and I hope if you're at home you've blown the roofs off your homes in singing out. Okay time for the children's talk and uh, uh, we're back to the commandments this week and uh, Mark has uh, prepared a talk for us which we're going to watch now. Morning children and this morning we're looking at the seventh commandment in our little series on the ten commandments which as you can see on your screen there is from Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, be faithful in marriage. Let me tell you a little story that's on the screen there as well. It's called a special promise. Mum and dad are looking at photographs. They laugh at some of the pictures they have taken. Mum shows Sam a photograph of him as a baby. Sam has grown a lot since then. Dad shows Katie a picture of mum and dad when she was a little girl. Katie and mum look like each other. Sam looks at a photograph of mum and dad. They're all dressed up in funny clothes. Dad says this was taken on their wedding day when they were married. Sam asks mum why she wears a ring on her finger. Mum says it helps her to remember the promise she made to dad. Sam knows that promises are very important. When you make a promise, you must always keep it. Mum and Dad have promised to love each other always. Sam and Katie are glad and know that God is pleased too. Be faithful in marriage. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. So this is the commandment that we're looking at this morning. And as we look at this commandment this morning, let me ask you a question. Have you ever made a promise or broken a promise before? Because this commandment is all about keeping promises, as the story showed, as Sam and Katie's mum and dad had promised to love each other always. It's about the promise a husband says to a wife and a wife says to a husband on their wedding day. And it's about them keeping that promise as long as they live. Now, have you ever been to a wedding? Sometimes weddings can be quite a long day, can't they? They can be a bit boring, but there's one really important part in the wedding that really isn't boring. It's that special part in the service when the bride and the groom say their vows, make their promises to one another and to God. And I wonder if you've ever heard of these words before, when, when, we, when we hear these words, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death does do part. These words promise to be faithful to one another to not give up on one another, to love one another and commit to one another always. And the seventh commandment, be faithful in marriage, is God saying, when it comes to marriage, keep my rules and don't make up your own rules. You have one wife or one husband until death. Don't hurt the person you love or disobey God by replacing them with someone else who isn't your wife or isn't your husband. 
See, when we make up our own rules and break our word, the Bible has a word for that. The Bible calls that unfaithful. So marriage is really important because it's promising a lifelong commitment and lifelong love to one person as long as we live. Now, you might be thinking, though, well, what's that got to do with me? I'm way, 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 way too young to get married. And I don't even want to get married. Well, being faithful and keeping our promises in whatever context is important, isn't it? But more than that, being faithful and keeping your promise in marriage is actually a picture of a much bigger relationship. It's a picture of our relationship with God. And so even if you're not married yet or, or you never do get married, you can still take this command seriously. We see it, in fact, throughout the whole of the Old Testament. Believe it or not, this commandment was given at a time, the Ten Commandments were given at a time when Israel made specific promises to God in something a bit like a wedding. They promised to be faithful to God and not love other gods that are called idols, that are man-made gods, to not love other things more than God. And, and there was a big ceremony that took place. They promised that and they promised to follow God's ways. But do you think the people of Israel kept their promises? Well, we read the Old Testament and we can answer no. Throughout the Bible, God calls Israel unfaithful. Someone who keeps breaking their promise to God. And it's a problem we have too, of course. We, we struggle to be faithful to God all the time because there's other things we love more than God. And so someone else needed to be faithful for us. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came and was completely faithful to God for us so that if we turn to him and if we trust in him, we can still have a relationship with God. So we, we have this relationship with God through Jesus, the faithful one. And the earliest Christians saw this relationship with Jesus as a marriage. In fact, marriage is a picture of our relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the faithful groom who commits to his beautiful bride, the church, those who believe in Jesus and are baptized. And so the command to be faithful in marriage not only tells us how serious marriage is and, and emphasizes the need to be faithful to one another, it also shows us that Jesus has committed to us and is faithful to us always. And the question is, as we finish, Will we commit and promise to be faithful to Jesus? Thank you. Well, we're going to uh, hear God's word read now. We're going to read quite a large section of the letter of Paul to the Colossians, Colossians 3, 1 to 4, 6. And uh, Jenny Sweeney is going to come and read it for us. Colossians 3, starting at verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, 
circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing into God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it, not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be paid for their wrongs, and there is no favouritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always with of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Amen. Lee, thank you very much. Well, we're going to uh, sing again. And uh, this is a song, um, O oh Jesus, I have promised, just as he is faithful to us, so we commit to being faithful to him. And so that's the spirit behind this song that we're going to sing now as we prepare to hear God's word. And after we've sung this song, it will be time for those heading out to Bible explorers to do so. So let's sing. Let me hear you speak. 
fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. That's what we're thinking about today, faithfulness. Being utterly dependable, trustworthy, not over-promising, but being able to keep your word. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, this then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and of those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Uh, When I left uh, secular employment and uh, came into Christian ministry, uh, for the first few years, every now and again, I would go back uh, to London where I worked and uh, uh, a friend of mine, a colleague, plus uh, one of the directors, would, uh, we would often go out for lunch uh, together. And um, uh, the, the director turned to me one time and said, uh, so how do you measure success in your line of business? <laughs> Knowing that I'd become a pastor of a church. Threw me a little bit. How do you measure success? And how do you explain that to you know, a director of a big company? Well, in many ways, the essence of success in terms of following the Lord Jesus Christ is remaining faithful. Faithful to what he has called us to. Because ultimately, it's his work and the the outcome and the results are down to him. Moses struck the rock and it looked like a great success. Water gushed forth from the rock and million people plus their animals drank. But God was not impressed. Because God had said, speak to the rock, not strike it. And Moses had not been faithful to God. And that action led him to be disqualified from leading the people into the promised land. Faithfulness is what God is. God says in his word, he who trusts in him, speaking of his son, will never be put to shame. God is utterly reliable. God is a God who makes promises and keeps them. From the beginning to the end of the Bible, it's proclaiming to us that God, who is faithful. 
But then God, by his spirit, then transforms us to make us like his son. And that involves making us into people who are faithful and who are obedient and complete the, the tasks that we have been entrusted with. That won't be exactly the same for each of us. Naturally, we are very self-serving. We promise much. We deliver little. But the Spirit comes and changes us and transforms us to be faithful. Now, the letter to the Colossians that we've read uh, several sections from this morning has much to teach us about this theme of faithfulness. The letter begins, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 4 says, because you have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people. So hearing of their faith. 123, he says, if you continue in your faith, the idea of being faithful and continuing on the journey they have begun. Chapter 2, verse 6, that so then just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. He wants them to grow and continue being faithful. So this morning we're going to, uh, as we explore this theme of faithfulness, we're looking at the whole letter of the Colossians, something of an overview of the, of the letter. And we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at becoming faithful, living faithfully, and growing in faithfulness. Okay, becoming faithful, living faithfully, and growing faithfulness. So first of all then, becoming faithful. Uh, the way Paul describes the Colossians, and remember he's never met them, in the opening greeting is very interesting. Describing them to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. He describes them as God's holy people, but he describes their status as being faithful, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, if you look at Paul's different letters that he's written, 13 of them in the uh, New Testament, this is the only one where he describes the people he's writing to in these terms. And actually, what you often find is Paul is very clever. He he weaves into the greeting something of the theme that he wants to pick up in the letter. And that's why Colossians is a great place to come to, to think about faithfulness. And here it is, right in this opening greeting. The idea, it's the idea of believing and of being dedicated and loyal to God and the gospel. And uh, he, he doesn't want them then, the reason he's writing this letter, he's concerned for them, he doesn't want them to drift away. He wants them to remain faithful to the gospel. And so that's his whole purpose in, in writing. So what we're discovering is that being faithful is at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. This isn't some add-on. Yes, you can grow in faithfulness and you can develop your faithfulness, but being faithful in essence is something which is at the very heart and is essential to what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian is someone who trusts in Christ to save them and now look to him to remain faithful to that promise. Well, let's uh, ask the question, so how did they become faithful? Well, Paul explains in verses 3 to 6 of chapter 1. He says, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. 
Now, I think the easiest way to answer this question, how did they become faithful, is just to work backwards through that, those, those three verses. So he says at the, in the end, from five into six, that they heard the true message of the gospel. So a message came to them. The message which was all about Jesus, about who Jesus is and what he did. He goes on to tell us that it was through Epaphras, who was another faithful minister of Christ. There's the word again. It was Epaphras who brought the message to them, explained to them about the Lord Jesus and who he was and what he could do and how he had died on the cross and how he had come from heaven. And as they heard this message, it was a message of hope, that there is, a, he says, a, uh, the hope which is stored up for you in heaven. They realised that through this Lord Jesus then and what he had done, they could be forgiven and they could go to heaven. This was what was being offered to them because of what the Lord Jesus had done in his death. And then we're told they responded to that message. They put their faith in Christ Jesus. Heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, he says, verse 4 that came from hearing that message. They came to a point where they put all their weight and all their confidence on him. It was a huge change that took place in their lives. He sums it up in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1 like this, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The point is this, they became faithful by coming to know Jesus. These are fruits of the Spirit. Faithfulness is the fruit of the Spirit's work. As the Spirit worked in them to bring them out of darkness, to bring them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they become people who are described as faithful. And that's true for every person who is brought to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is brought to that point where you put your confidence in him and what he has done for the hope of heaven. And that's why Paul is so thankful for them, because this is what God has done. So if you're going to know faithfulness in your life, you need to be a faithful person. You need to be a Christian. If your life is full of broken promises and you're full of unreliability, that your life is full of chaos, that you find that you're being fickle, that you never finish anything, perhaps this is a sign of a deep problem in your life that needs to be resolved and isn't going to be resolved from just saying, I need to be more successful, I need to do better. You need actually for an inner transformation that's going to turn you into something new. And the good news is that Jesus came to rescue and to forgive and to restore and to transform and to make people who are faithless and make them faithful. And that journey begins at the cross begins by getting your head around what was taking place as Jesus died for sinners in all their brokenness and all their unfaithfulness to bring them back to himself that they might then become faithful people. Okay, let's move on. Living faithfully. So Paul has written this letter. Uh, he describes them as faithful, but in a sense, he doesn't stop there. He wants them to go on being uh, faithful. That's why he prays in verse 11 that they would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you might have great endurance and patience. He recognises that Christian life is a, is a journey through life and that they need to remain faithful every day on that journey. And so he prays that they would and he urges them in verse 23, to continue in your faith, established and firm. Do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. And then in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, which are probably the key verses that give the whole theme of the book, he says, just then, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, 
Continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. He's saying you have everything you need in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need any extra, but you now need to live faithfully to that Lord Jesus Christ who has saved you. In the second half of the book, and uh, Jenny read to us a big section of that second half from 3, 1 to 4, 6. He shows us what living faithfully looks like. And in that section from 3, 1 to 4, 6, he gives us five key relationships or areas of life where we are to live faithfully. Now we could do a sermon or two on every one of them. And you'll be pleased to hear we're not doing that this morning. This is, so if, you, if, we, if we go too quickly and you go, hang on, there's detail there I want to know. Out. Well, that's not the point this morning. The point this morning is to show you that faithfulness is in so many different aspects of life. That's the picture I want you to get from this passage. So first of all, we're to be faithful to Christ. This is the theme of verses 1 to 8 of uh, chapter 3. He reminds us that we have been united to the Lord Jesus Christ, that our life is bound up with his. There is a, a union between us and Christ. But he says, you must be dependable and trustworthy towards him. And that involves then, he tells us, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Set your hearts on things above. This is what is involved in being faithful to Christ, is setting our hearts towards him. He is our friend, he is our lover who died and rose again. And he's one day is coming back. And he's saying, Set the centre of your life on him. Not on this world, but on Christ and where he is seated. Let that govern everything that's going on in your, your life. You know, when you get baptised, uh, you're symbolising what has happened to you by the Lord Jesus Christ, coming and dying to wash you clean of your sins and make you right with God. But you're also making a public commitment to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to be faithful to him as his disciple. Not only are we to set our minds on uh, uh, things above, on Christ, but also we are, there are certain behaviours that then are inconsistent with uh, following the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, put to death, in verse 5, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust and evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. These are part of your old life that need to be put away. As I say, there's so much more we could say about all of these things, but the point is this. He has been faithful to us. Christ has never let you down and never will let you down. But the challenge is, are we being faithful to him? Or is the reality that actually that we're setting our minds on other things, things of this world? And that we are living in a way which is inconsistent and displeasing to him. So first of all, faithful to Christ. Secondly, faithful to our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the theme of chapter 3, 9 to 17. Now, uh, you've noticed in verse 9, if you read it carefully, that there is a sudden change from things which are just personal things, which he's been talking about so far, to suddenly it's all about how we relate to other people. So verse 9 says, do not lie to each other since you've taken off the old self with its practices. And then he goes on to talk about how we've all become united in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we're God's chosen people, and that we're to bear with one another and to forgive each other and to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts as members of one body and encourage one another. So this whole section from verse 9 to 17 is all about our 
relationships in the church. And he's saying, be faithful then to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And top of the list is telling the truth, which of course goes to the very heart of what it means to be faithful. You know how it is with people who lie all the time. And some people, it just becomes habitual. It's just almost like part of who they are. And you never know where you are with them. Because you, know, you can't trust anything that comes out of their mouth. But if we're to be reliable and faithful towards one another, then we have to tell the truth. We have to get away from over-promising just because it pleases somebody in the moment. I read a little thing this week. Five rules for social media. Being careful what you post. Is it truthful, helpful, informative, necessary, kind? Think. Truthful, helpful, informative, necessary, kind. And that should be what governs all of our speaking and interaction with one another in the church, isn't it? Not just online or in emails or text messages, but uh, face to face and in other ways too. But being faithful is not just about telling the truth, it's also about sticking with them. Verses 13 and 14, bear with each other, he says, and forgive one another. Yes, sometimes we rub each other up the wrong way, don't we? But being faithful is not sort of taking your back home and I don't want anything more to do with those people, but is working it through, is forgiving. Put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. And it's about encouraging one another, letting the peace of Christ and then the message of Christ Dwell amongst you as you teach and admonish and as you sing psalms and hymns in the Spirit. We're encouraging one another with the truths of the gospel. Particularly through singing, how we've missed it. But we're called in our faithfulness then, it's not just towards Christ, but towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. So are you being faithful to your church family that God has put you amongst? Or are you drifting? It's been hard through the pandemic, hasn't it? We've had to work harder at encouraging and keeping up with one another. And it's great now we can start to regather and do more together. Faithful to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Thirdly, faithful to our families. This is the theme of verses 18 to 21, where he addresses wives, husbands, children and fathers. And in all those relationships, we need faithfulness. Again, I'm not going to go into all the detail here of what's said to each part. I'm just trying to make a bigger point. But when you get married... As we were point, reminded in the children's talk, you make promises of commitment. You promise to love them and you pr promise loyalty and you promise friendship and you promise mutual dependence. And with God's help then, you're seeking to be faithful and reliable and consistent in all the ups and downs of life and loving and submitting. very interesting in the marriage vows isn't it it's not about the day itself it's about the future and you're promising for better for worse I'm going to keep loving you maybe for some of you today listening watching here you're going through a period of worse period of sickness and it doesn't feel all gooey and lovely it's hard work but you made promises to be faithful whatever may come trusting the Lord for the grace and the help 
that you need. And that's an outworking of our uh, obedience to Christ, isn't it? Remaining faithful to our families. Whatever the circumstances and situations that we find ourselves in. It's not just to uh, husband and wives, but it's also children and parents. Children to their parents and parents to their children. And now the, the dynamics of that relationship varies through life, isn't it? When you're, when you're small, the command is to obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Obviously, when you're grown up and you've left home, you, you don't obey your parents, but you still honour them. And it's a call to be faithful to those family bonds that God has established in. And again, some of us have, uh, some have families which are a hard work, complicated relationships. But we're being called to be faithful. Again, what that's going to look like is going to vary and differ. But that's the calling. And then faithful in our work. So he goes on to talk to uh, slaves and masters. And, uh, but there's great principles here in what is written for uh, workers and bosses, for employees and employers. And as he says to slaves, then he says, you know, don't just uh, uh, work hard when you're being watched. But do all your work unto the Lord. Be faithful to him in the work that he has given you to do. And let's face it, some work is boring and dull and you'd rather not do it, but we're called to be faithful in our work. I think we need to get back to seeing the dignity of all work. I think we've got to a point where some work we don't see as important or valuable as we should. What were the things that God gave Adam and Eve to do right back in the beginning? Cleaning, caring, designing, bringing order out of chaos. Whenever we do any of those things, we are imaging the creator who made us who put us into a garden, put us into this world in order to make and to keep order. We need to learn to do it well. Maybe some of us need to change our mindset and think about all work, not just the bits that we like or we do as being of dignified and valuable. I think our whole society's got muddled on this. It's all about money and fame and success, isn't it? And, and the pandemic's shown us as who, the, who the key workers are, the, the ones where, where there's great dignity actually in it, but we don't value them as we should. If you're a boss or a manager, he says, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you have a master in heaven. Are you a faithful boss where your primary concern is for the care of your employees, not the company or the bottom line? That's a totally radical and different approach to what is going on in so much of business. But if we're going to be faithful to our calling, then it's going to affect our work, whether we're an employee or a, an employer. And then faithful towards outsiders. Chapter 4, verses 2 through to 6. When you first read those verses, you think it's, you know, it's like he's just getting near the end of the letter and he's got a load of random things to say. But actually what you see, this is all about how you act towards those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. And he's saying you should be prayerful and concerned and praying that the gospel may go forth 
that there will be opportunities to, to, for the message to be proclaimed, that they too might hear and believe. So whatever, whoever you have contact with, whether it's work colleagues, or whether it's the post person who delivers the mail, or people on the supermarket checkout, or people on the phone that you have to ring up, we should have a be faithful in our dealings with them. We have, should have a concern for them, that they too would hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way he says that is, is to pray and to seek opportunities, not being forceful, but, but let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that, they, so that they will ask you questions and then you'll have ways to speak of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So be wise in the way you behave, particularly with your speech. Gracious and salt, it's adding flavour. Your speech shouldn't be dirty or brash or overconfident, but straightforward and honest. The point I'm trying to make, I believe the point that Paul is making with this letter, is that faithfulness applies across the board. Don't narrow it down and say, ah, oh, yes, I'm being faithful in this. Whereas actually God wants to say, I want you to be faithful in everything that I've given you. I want you to be faithful towards Christ who has saved you and faithful to your brothers and sisters in your church family. I want you to be faithful to your, your uh, earthly or human family. I want you to be faithful in your work, whatever it might be. And I want you to be faithful to those who don't know the Lord Jesus yet. It's the entire fabric of life is to be characterised by faithfulness. That we're to be those who are utterly dependable, trustworthy, not over-promising, who are obedient to God's commands where they apply in those different situations, who complete the, the tasks that we have been entrusted with and use the gifts that we have been given. You see, it's about the type of person that we are called to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, one more thing very quickly, growing faithfulness. So how do we cultivate this fruit of the Spirit? Well, the key verses that teach us how to grow uh, uh, faithfulness are Colossians 2, 6 and 7. So then... Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Now, the vital point of growing faithfulness is this. You don't add, you go deeper. Okay, you don't add, you go deeper. This is not a call to add faithfulness on as some extra. Rather, it's to work out the faithfulness that you have been given by the very fact that you know Christ Jesus as Lord and to work that out into every area of life. When a baby is born, it's born complete doesn't, on its second birthday, get a leg added on. And when it's four, it gets the other one. And when it's five, it gets some arms and so on. Yes, a baby needs to grow. But it's complete. And you, as a Christian, have everything you need in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to add extra, you need to grow more of him. 
And that's the whole point of the letter of the Colossians. We didn't get a chance to read anything from chapter 2, but Paul is concerned for them because they're being told they need to add this extra here and add this, whether it's rules or all sorts of things. They're being told you need to add on or special knowledge if they're going to, to reach maturity. And he's saying, no, you don't. You have everything you need in Christ. Listen to 2.9. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in body bodily form and in Christ you have been brought to fullness he is the head over every power and authority you have everything you need in the Lord Jesus Christ you have everything you need for life and godliness a Christian is somebody who has been planted into Christ their roots are going into something vast and glorious so deep and so wonderful that you can never exhaust it. And the need is for the roots to go further in. That's what you and I need. We need to appreciate more of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be taken up more with the wonders of his incredible love and faithfulness towards us. And he says, as we are taken up with his faithfulness to us and just the, the majesty of who he is and all that he has done in dying for us, it's as that, as that truth and that reality and him in all his loveliness for us that takes over our minds and hearts that we will grow to be like him. So don't go from here this morning saying, I need to add faithfulness into my life. No, you need to grow in the faithfulness that Christ has given you and show it in all these different areas of your life. And if you want to grow in it, grow in him. Be rooted and built up and strengthened in the faith that you have and have been given in the wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. He really is everything. As we read, to begin, read to be together at the beginning, he's the image of the invisible God. And he's the head of the body. The beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that everything he might have the supremacy. That's where you start. That's where you continue. May God... Make us those who keep in step with the Spirit and indeed are faithful people because we've met a faithful Saviour. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, this letter to the Colossians that we've dipped into this morning. Thank you that by drawing us to yourself, you make us faithful people. And Lord, we pray you'd help us to live faithfully to Christ, to our brothers and sisters, to our families, in our work, to outsiders. And Lord, grow our faithfulness as we appreciate more and more Jesus and all that he has done for us. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, we're going to shift our eyes back on the Lord Jesus as we uh, conclude our service, or this part of the service. He will hold me fast. He will be faithful to us. That's the key, isn't it? So let's uh, sing of that wonderful truth that he will hold us fast.
back. For those of you who are watching this as a catch-up, uh, that's the end of the service and thanks so much for watching and do uh, tune in again. We meet every Sunday at 10.30 in the morning and 6pm in the evening.